Hi, I'm Darren, and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. In today's episode, I'll be beginning a new project to construct an amateur radio receiver. So a couple of unique features for this episode. First of all, I've got nothing to hold and show. Unlike many of my prior episodes, this one's starting in the concept and idea creation phase, so nothing physical exists yet. And the second feature is, for this project I'm planning on doing shorter episodes, probably around 10 minutes or so in length, unlike my typical episodes which are average about 20 minutes. The reason being this is a much more complex project and will be spread out more over time, so this gives me an opportunity to have regular breaks between episodes and show some of the other projects I'm working on. Now folks have been home building receivers for nearly a hundred years now, and as you see in a moment when I go through my design concept, there's nothing fundamentally new that I'll be doing here. But personally, there are some really cool features of this project that definitely interest me. This will be the first from scratch super het receiver that I've ever built. Now I've worked on them and repaired them over the last several years, so I know how they work. And most recently I built a homebrew direct conversion receiver. That's the short video on the WWV receiver that I built. So this will be some new challenges for me. The second challenge for me is this will be my first Arduino project. Now I know I'm coming into that party a little bit late, but I decided to come in with a bang, meaning I have no intention or desire whatsoever to do something as simple as just turn on a few LEDs. I want something more substantial. And as you'll see, again, when I go through the layout for this design concept, it is fairly substantial. But before I dive into a review of the design concept, there's one big question at this point. Why just build a receiver? receiver? Why, not Why not build a full feature transceiver? Trans well, that's definitely a fair question, and the best answers I can give is I wanted to limit the scope of this project to something that was manageable. There's certainly plenty to learn here from just building the receiver, and definitely the lessons learned and some of the elements that I'm going to build could be extensible in the future to a full-featured transceiver, so maybe that'll be a future project down the road. Naturally, I have other projects I want to feature on my channel, and I can't just let one monopolize my time. So limiting this project to just a receiver will help free up more time for those projects. Okay, that's enough background. Now I want to talk about specifics. So the actual design I'm going to construct here is created by Jim Forkin, amateur call sign WA3TFS. Now Jim has had his work published in QST Magazine several times, and his publications include this receiver, as well as a notch filter improvement and an automatic gain circuit uh, improvement to add to this receiver. So I will be incorporating all of those with his base receiver, as well as adding a few changes of my own. So let's start by taking a detailed look at Jim's design. It's a single IF frequency superheterodyne architecture. Power requirements are 12 volts of DC, which needs to come externally because there's no integrated AC to DC power supply. It's a single band receiver, and the way Jim spec the bandpass filter, it's for the 40 meter band. But supporting other bands is as simple as reconfiguring the bandpass filter components and altering the microcontroller software. And speaking of that, it uses the ubiquitous Arduino Nano single board microcontroller to drive an analog device's AD9850, which in turn provides the VFO signal. For the BFO signal, a fixed frequency 9 MHz crystal oscillator is used. The Arduino also drives a color display of key receiver functions. A user-selectable bandwidth IF filter is controlled via a front panel switch between a narrow and a wide bandwidth and user-adjustable RF gain and AF gain pots round out the user controls. Here's my modified version, and I'm showing here the list of base features with my changes shown in red, as well as a block diagram that I created for my approach. Also take note of the key down here. It indicates the radio frequency, audio frequency, and control signal paths. I've labeled the various amplifiers with V or F to indicate that their respective gain is fixed or variable. So starting from the antenna input, my first change is to add a space for a broadcast bandstop filter. This is an element Jim suggested to add, and I'm showing it as optional for now because I'm not sure I'm going to need it, but I'll reserve space for it just in case. Next up is the bandpass filter stage. I want to make this receiver capable for multiple handbands, and worst case that requires a bandpass filter for each band. More on that in a moment. 
Continuing forward, I'm also going to change from the AD9850 to the widely used SI5351. That way I'll get both the VFO frequency plus an appropriate beat frequency depending on whether the user has selected lower sideband, upper sideband, or CW, which is yet another feature I'm adding. Next change is in the variable bandwidth crystal filter. I'll have the Arduino control this filter rather than have a switch on the front panel. Then comes the IF amp which retains the user variable gain but also adds an automatic gain control feedback input from the downstream audio amplifier. This is another one of Jim's suggested adds. The remaining changes include adding Jim's notch filter and then lastly modifying the audio amplifier stages. I'm planning on having the amp capable of driving a built-in speaker as well as reduced power output for headphones so that might require two ICs. Not shown on the block diagram are two other additional features that I'm going to include. The first is an S meter. The automatic gain control circuit has an output to drive a meter, so I've already got the necessary electrical signal. The second item is much less visual but much more practical. It's a simple P-channel MOSFET circuit to provide reverse voltage protection. I'll talk about those more in a bit, but first I want to jump back to what I said earlier about the bandpass filters. What I'm envisioning here is to have the ability to cover all 10 of the amateur bands from 160 meters through 10 meters. However, there's a catch. To cover all 10 of those spectrum slices might require a unique bandpass filter for each band and some sort of switching network to choose the correct one. And that's certainly doable. Any multi-band rig will have banks of filters that are either manually or automatically switched to match the chosen frequency. And I certainly could do that here if I wanted to hand wind a crap ton of ferrite cores and make the rig large enough to hold them all, which I don't. One possible solution is something similar to the bandpass filter module created by Dave Brainerd, amateur call sign WB6DHW. He has an elegant bandpass filter module designed that instead of using hand-wound toroid inductors, it uses all surface mount construction, including the inductors, so it's pretty compact. I've designed and built some small filters myself using all SMT construction, so I know firsthand how much smaller and easier to build they can be. Another solution would be to stick with the traditional hand-wound toroids, but only populate the rig with two or three filters at a time. These filters could look something like these offered by QRP Labs. They're basically a rectangular strip of PCB to hold the filter components and a simple pin and socket connector on either end. Charlie Morris has also shown a very similar topology on his YouTube channel and there are plenty of reference designs and online calculators to help folks make them. I like this modular approach a lot. If I go this route, I'd have sockets for two or three filters in the rig and then swap out filters whenever I want to change from the set and the receiver. Now I'd also include additional pins that will be hard coded to represent a specific filter. Then I can use the Arduino to read those pins and automatically set the appropriate band parameters for the display and the VFO. Because there's an Arduino in this design, I want to maximize its utility and have it control many of the functions through just a couple of encoders. That will enable me to avoid cluttering the front panel with a bunch of knobs and switches. In theory, I could get by with just a single encoder and push button and write complex code with nested menus and let that be the user interface. And then the Arduino could just handle all the hardware control behind the scenes through relays and digipods. Now, there's certainly an art to trying to get minimalist interface design right. And the best example that I can think of is my old iPod Classic. I mean, I love this interface. I've been using this for years. I'm still holding on to it, obviously, after uh, many, many years of obsolescence. But um, it's a good example of, of Oh, doing an interface right and it's intuitive once you figure it out. But too much of that minimalist approach could make the interface slow and cumbersome for the user. A good example specific to this project is the, is the notch frequency adjust control. Now I could very easily do that through the menu and have a couple digipots handle it, but the reality is there's going to be times I can see where I'm actively receiving and I'll want to adjust that uh, frequency along with adjusting other controls. So having to bounce back and forth between nested menus, that's just not going to work. Back to the S meter. I know I want one, but I'm undecided as to what it should look like. Should I use a traditional analog meter? A 10 segment LED bar graph display? A virtual bar graph on the color display? Or maybe something really fancy like a simulated magic eye tube? Or maybe even a custom circular array of LEDs around the tuning knob? In any case, I know it's just eye candy. An S meter doesn't really do much substantial, but there's nothing wrong with adding a bit of bling to a project. 
And lastly, there's reverse voltage protection. I consider having this protection mandatory for any gear that doesn't have a built-in AC to DC power supply or a dedicated external power pack. I don't have an Anderson power pole connectorized 12 volt network in my lab nor in my shack, so it's not a matter of if I'll accidentally connect the power backwards, but when. Fortunately, there's many ways to achieve this protection, the simplest being just a series silicon rectifier diode. But a better way is to use a P-channel MOSFET, and I'm going to use this concept shown on Afrotech Mod's YouTube channel. This approach is robust and has a much lower VCC insertion loss than using a diode. And that's where I am on the development of the concept for this receiver. As I said in my intro, I'm going to build on the work that's been shared publicly by others, and there's definitely a very big pool of great stuff out there that's been shared. I want to extend my thanks to Jim Forkin and all the other folks who have shared that work to make um, putting together a receiver like this so much easier. So, next steps, well, I got my list here of things that will be in the next video. Things like making choices in the bandpass filter, deciding on the construction for the S meter, uh, making a detailed schematic and final selections on a case and front panel layout, make the final component selections for all, all the circuits, and I'm planning on running a few LT SPICE simulations to show that this thing's actually going to work before I put it together. So, look for that in the upcoming videos. So, until next time, bye for now.